First of all, I would like to thank everyone for coming to attend the symposium. I would like to thank the organizer for giving us the opportunity uh, to be part of this fantastic convention. This is my first time here and definitely not the last one, so I'm really excited. Um, I uh, would like also um, to convey Dr. Uh, Richard Smith's deepest apologies and uh, disappointment for not being able to be here today. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about the complexities of genetic hearing loss. And I'm going to show you that these complexities uh, happen at several levels. As Dr. Friedman said, uh, hearing loss is the most common sensory disorder, and it is affecting over a mil 400 million people worldwide. And interestingly, this number is predicted to double by the 2050 year, year 2050. Even amongst other genetic disorders, hearing loss is one of the most common disorders. Uh, one of the most striking characteristics of hearing loss is its clinical heterogeneity or phenotypic heterogeneity. So hearing loss could be non-syndromic and syndromic. Uh, it could be sensorineural or conductive. Uh, there is a difference in the onset of uh, hearing loss, the severity of the hearing loss, the frequencies affected, the symmetry, and the progression. When we look at uh, a uh, audiogram, as you are all familiar with this, you can sometimes actually, just looking at the audio profile, how the audiogram looks like, you can predict which gene is the causative for, these, for this family. For example, as you see there, WFS1 is really known for low frequency hearing loss. Some other genes, like autosomal dominant, generally and usually most of them start with high frequency hearing loss. Something like GJB2, it's profound flat across all frequencies. It's not surprising that this complex hit, uh, clinical heterogeneity is actually mirrored at the genetic level with the identification of over 150 genes uh, causally linked to deafness. And this journey actually started a little over two decades ago with the identification of the first gene in 1995, PAU3F4. And this uh, discovery in gene implicated in hearing loss has actually dramatically progressed and increased with the advent of next generation sequencing. These are new technologies. It's kind of you are comparing your old land phone to the newest smartphone, iPhone. And so that has dramatically changed the way we do genetics and actually allowed us to identify much, many more genes. These genes are actually, there are over 7,000 mutations till now reported in all these genes. Really what is fascinating is when we look closer at these genes, as Dr. Friedman showed, they have so many different functions. They are expressed in so many different parts of the ear. They are expressed at specific time points, either during development, embryonic development, or later in adult life. And before proceeding forward, I would like just to remind you of a few um, uh, nomenclature, key vocabula vocabulary that I will be using. Phenotype is, again, the way a person looks. So uh, having a blonde hair, that's a phenotype. Having hearing loss is a phenotype. Genotype is actually the genetic variations in a gene that a given person carries. Um, one of the things we study is the relationship between a person's genotype and how it relates to its uh, to his or her deafness or hearing loss phenotype. And to do this, we have to have pedigrees. Again, that's all this. Um, Dr. Freeman already went over that in detail. And, but second and most important, we have to screen all the genes that are involved in hearing loss. So that means screening all 152 genes. I'm going to pass over these as Dr. Friedman showed them. So how do we do to screen all 152 genes? The way it used to be before, it's we do it gene by gene. That is time consuming, it's very expensive, and it takes years. And the solve rate or the diagnosis rate was really low. What we are doing now, it's what we call next generation sequencing. And as I said, it's a very complicated process that always starts with getting blood, extracting the DNA, from the blood, then a series of experiments, 
um, and the step that involves bench work, where we amplify specific regions that we are interested from the whole genome. In the case of hearing loss, is actually amplifying the specific region for the 152 genes that are involved. The, the step after that, it's a very um, computing. We need a lot of computing powers, very huge, very powerful computers, to be able to go through all that data. It's a huge, it's a big data analyze it and make sense of it and show it to us in a way that we could read it. So for each patient, for example, that we, uh, we screen with panels for hearing loss, we usually identify around 200 different genetic variants. Not all of them are causing, some of them are just polymorphisms, but one of them is going to be the, the genetic cause for the hearing loss for this individual. So like all labs, there are meetings with the clinicians, geneticists, scientists, technicians, bioinformaticians, and genetic counselors to go look at the genetic data that we obtained from sequencing and look at the phenotype, the audiogram data, audiometric data, all the clinical data that is available, and try to make sense of that. Does actually this, vignette, this genetic variant, does it make sense? Could it be the cause of the hearing loss for this uh, person. So I am going to go over a few examples just to show you, um, kind of shed light on some of the complexities associated with hearing loss. So recently, we have in the lab uh, a kid, is a seven-year-old boy, and with congenital severe hearing loss. A family history and a pedigree indicates that his mom actually has a white forelock, it's white hair on the forehead. And this is usually associated with a syndrome called Wardenburg syndrome. So the interesting th the part of this, actually, is this boy has already underwent genetic screening somewhere else for a panel that have uh, genes for Wardenburg syndrome, and it was negative. So when it was sent to us, we dug deeper, and we did something else called um, copy number variation analysis. So what that does, it doesn't just look at point mutation, like simple mutation. It also looks at big chunk of DNA that is deleted. And what we found out is that kid actually have a deletion. You see it here in these red dots on the figure on the top. And this is what it is. It's have half, this, this uh, individual has half of the DNA of that specific region of a normal person. So, and that gene was actually SOX10, which is involved in Wardenburg syndrome. It just, this is actually the lesson learned from here, is that genetic testing has to be comprehensive. It has to be uh, screening for all genes and has to be mostly involving copy number variation analysis. Uh, the second uh, case I am going over is we received the DNA from a 43-year-old male he has bilateral profound hearing loss. We didn't know ha have any information about the family history, whether there are other uh, people or relatives that are affected or not. The most important part is the clinician, when they saw this patient and did all the clinical exams, they said, this patient has Usher syndrome. Usher syndrome is hearing loss. And they said Usher syndrome type one, because it has hearing loss um, that is profound and retinitis pigmentosa. When we did the genetic analysis, to our biggest surprise, this patient did not have Usher syndrome. What it actually has, what he actually has, is a mutation in a gene called SLC26A4, two mutations, and that explains his profound hearing loss. What explains his retinopathy is actually a mutation in a gene called OPA1, and that OPA1 is is for optic, uh, for optic atrophy. So this is just to emphasize again how genetic testing is very important to clinically diagnose a patient. And I, um, I, I will move forward with another example. So there is um, called 11A1, that's a gene that till now we thought was only associated with non-syndromic hearing loss. And with, no, oh, sorry, that was known to be associated with syndromic hearing loss, what we call Marshall and Stickler syndrome. And this is, um, it's, it's a disorder of the connective tissue plus hearing loss. We asserted the uh, family, it's a big, nice family, segregating 
what at the time we thought was autosomal dominant non-syndromic hearing loss. Actually, the journey to discover the gene responsible for this family uh, hearing loss lasted over two decades. We received the DNA in 1998, and we were unsuccessful in the diagnosing or finding the genetic cause of this family. And this is because, again, technology limitations, sequencing limitations, and also human errors and human uh, assumptions. Finally, with whole exome sequencing, we perform whole exome sequencing. This is we scanned all the genes in the human genome. And we found that they actually uh, carry a mutation in this coli 11 a one So now we have learned that coli 11 a one in addition to being responsible for syndromic hearing loss, is also responsible for non-syndromic hearing loss. Oops. Um, the last example I am going to talk about is about the CYP2 gene. So what we thought before is CYP2 gene was responsible for Usher syndrome type 1, but is also uh, responsible for non-syndromic hearing loss. So this is one of the cases that Dr. Friedman talked about where one gene, specific mutation could be associated with non-syndromic hearing loss, whereas others are associated with syndromic hearing loss. So um, the story, with, we, we received one family, actually just one proband, and we discovered that there are nonsense mutation. This, this, uh, the kid carries two nonsense mutation in SIB2. And we sent the results back to the patient, and then the parents contacted us, is my kid going to have Usher syndrome? Because we do know the kid is, has foreign hearing loss. But is he going to develop blindness too? And they were really worried, and it's, it's a big implication for, uh, for planning, for healthcare, for everything. And we, have a, and us, we had an, an outstanding a grad student, um, Kevin Booth. He was not convinced of the association between CYP2 and, and Usher syndrome, because usually the way we know is nonsense or truncating mutations in genes cause Usher syndrome, whereas the missense ones do not, or usually are associated with non-syndromic. Anyway, he investigated more families. Uh, we collaborated with uh, people and scientists from France, and we actually proved that CYP2 was not associated with Usher syndrome type 1. That is a huge for families seeking information for this. Um, so just as a conclusion, I want, in summary, um, a large number of genes cause hearing loss. Um, all these genes can be tested for genetic variation simultaneously. Genetics of hearing loss is complex. And detailed studies of many families are refining our understanding of hearing loss. Each family has a different story. Each family has a new knowledge that we could gain from them. And um, this knowledge actually is improving um, healthcare today and will be the foundation for the development of novel strategies for gene therapy, for example, to improve healthcare tomorrow. Uh, I invite you all to attend workshop this afternoon as we will go over really way more details and more comprehensive uh, explanation of what is happening with genetic uh, analysis and genetic testing for hearing loss. And finally, I would like to thank um, all our collaborators. I would like to thank all the families and individuals that have contributed their time, their DNA, and all the information they have to help us in this quest. Um, I would like also to thank, we, could, we wouldn't be here if we, weren't, we haven't been standing in the like, sh giant shoulders. And those are scientists like Tom Friedman here, Dr. Richard Smith, uh, Dr. Andy Griffith, Christine Petit from France, uh, Bill Kimberling, uh, Guy Van Kamp, so many scientists all over the world that have been working so tirelessly over the last two decades so we could be here. And we, we, so we do know as much as we do right now about the genetics of hearing loss. So thank you to all of you. Thanks.